Thank you all. Thank you so much. And thank you for coming to such a weird event. I hope that I, <laughs> I, seeing this and seeing the whole schedule, it's just, it's truly impressive what the organizers has, have brought together. And um, it's a privilege to be a part of something so unusual, which I hope will in the future be less and less unusual. Um, as Johanna said, I'm John De La Parra, and I work at the Rockefeller Foundation, which um, is an institution over a hundred years that has worked to, um, as I like to say, uh, radically redistribute capital and then give the ability to improve lives to the people that need it the most. And that's what I hope to do with my work. Before that, I was I in academia. I uh, worked at MIT and Harvard, and a lot of that work was focused on looking at how indigenous and frontline communities use plants to uh, both use as medicine and as food. And there is, of course, a spectrum between medicine and food. Um, and there's a spectrum between what is actually medicinal and what is uh, something that supports and nourishes. So we'll talk a little bit about that. One thing I wanted to mention, too, listening to Gemma's talk behind the stage, um, I'm reminded of something that the philosopher Alan Watts uh, talked about once, which is um, the idea that often people try to describe the world as either goo, so a kind of primordial ooze, uncertainty, or on the other end, as prickles, so something very clear and distinct. But the truth is that the world is gooey prickles and prickly goo. So I hope that some of the things that I'll talk about today help to bridge that work. So as I mentioned, you know, working uh, in academia and, and working with indigenous communities to understand how plants were used as food and medicine, there is an understanding, as Gemma described, there's a deep understanding, there's a deep way of knowing, there's a development of knowledge that is often excluded from the ways that we think about scientific data. But it's, it's also, it's still human experience. The same way you ate your breakfast this morning and drank your coffee or whatever your morning ritual was, your instrument, your human body, decoded the flavors and could tell whether something was perhaps good for you or not. Part of the reason children crave sweets is because something so sweet and rich in nature in our original state would be very rare to find a very ripe fruit that would be so sweet. So of course children want to grab for that because it represents energy for that child, which would be rare in nature. So as part of all these efforts, what we're seeking to do through a project that I'll describe called the Periodic Table of Food Initiative is in a way decode that magic and mystery, those things that we know innately in ourselves that um, can be described with scientific data and can, I think, contribute to a better future. So I mentioned some of my own origins and this kind of desire. I grew up on a farm in the American South and uh, my grandmother often used plants as medicine and it, oh, it in within me, it often became a mystery and a magic to decode what does this mean? How does this reconcile with what we're told as children in school? How does, how does my grandmother's knowledge become the numbers and data and figures that we often interact with? And that will be addressed in this as well. And then this idea of food as medicine. So food is, uh, ca should and can be nourishing and we can use that to, to better both our human body and the planet, and we'll discuss that. And I, and I mentioned these indigenous ways of knowing, which um, perhaps are tending towards the less certain, the gooey side of, of how humans understand, and then think about how we can reconcile and bring it to the prickly goo or the gooey prickles. Um, with this project, the Periodic Table of Food, we, we started with a vision first, and that vision is to imagine a world where everyone has enough nourishing food to eat. Most projects that seek to, uh, the development work it's often called, to, to extend help to around the world are focused on enough food to eat. And a lot of that was addressed through something called the Green Revolution, which um, led to um, many people around the world having enough food to eat, but also we're now recognizing environmental destruction uh, destruction of community and many other what might be called unintended consequences or they might some might interpret them as intended consequences of such a system but we wanted to make sure that there was enough nourishing food to eat food that would nourish both people and planet so food should be nutritious it should be safe it should be affordable and it should be culturally relevant 
and that we seek to do that through this project as well. Everyone should know what they eat. Every day you hear new news that tells you about the things that you're eating and how that might impact your body or impact the environment. But we need empirical data. We need standardized data to be able to truly answer those questions. We need to be able to enable farmers to grow food in ways that nourish their local ecosystems. And we need to leverage the power of that food as an essential resource for human and planetary uh, well-being. So the periodic table of food initiative, PTFI as I'll refer to it, we have been working for about four and a half years at the foundation uh, to build a global ecosystem to map the planet's edible biodiversity. So no small feat. Um, we know there are at least over 7,000 different uh, edible plants in the world. So, uh, and to bridge with Gemma's talk, most of the foods that we eat are plants. Um, there is a small fraction, of course, of animal-based foods, and although in our own diets they are taking over an increasing amount of what our diets are, but in our own work we see that over 80% of the foods that have been nominated to be analyzed by this project that I'll describe are plant-based. Um, the, the periodic table of food focuses on food quality. So Gemma mentioned chemistry of plants and how plants can't run away. Um, that's, that's really important for why, why plants have become uh, chemists. In fact, it's been described that plants are constantly undergoing chemical warfare. So this chemical warfare that allows them to be uh, st staying in one place but still surviving, it's often that chemistry that is so essential. It's providing, as Gemma said, it attracts pollinators, it deters pests. B and then we consume those plants and we're consuming all of that chemistry. And how does that affect our bodies? It's a vast amount of complex chemistry. And we also, as we collect these data, we want to empower stakeholders themselves to choose which data is included in such a database and how that knowledge is shared. A lot of that knowledge that comes from indigenous and frontline communities needs to be protected so that it isn't exploited. So you might be familiar with the nutrition label that's on any uh, food that you might a packaged food that you might purchase, but then of course if on fresh produce we don't typically see this. But there exists some databases online. In the United States, the U.S. Defar Department of Agriculture um, has a website and you can see an apple has you know this much magnesium or this much uh, whatever nutrient that you might be interested in. But the truth is that the chemistry of our food is much more complex than that. Those labels maybe describe 10 things and those databases that exist might describe 100 to 150 chemical compounds that are in our food. But we know that there are thousands, if not tens of thousands, of complex chemistry that are in our foods. So how do we even begin to address this? So what we have started building are foundational resources in the form of tools, data, and training. And I'll go deeper into each one of them. And as part of that, we've built a global ecosystem, including every continent uh, except for Antarctica <laughs> in the world, um, with centers of excellence where people can analyze the foods that are most culturally relevant to them and that the decisions around how those data are used, how that knowledge is used, are up to them. And uh, we are fully inclusive. We have uh, nine centers of excellence and seven of them are in the global south. And you can see there's many other national labs and partner labs as well in the ecosystem. So first, the tools. So humans have been inventing tools to understand their environment for since, since we've been human and maybe before then. And what we have done is develop standardized tools so that anyone anywhere in the world can analyze their foods and it will be the same sort of data and it can be compared from lab to lab. So those standardizing of tools allow us to then scale those data, which really means that we can apply things like AI to those tools to answer very complex questions using massive data sets. What does it mean to look at the chemistry in, of food? What does it mean to look at the data that are in our food? Um, often when people hear chemicals, they think it's something outside of the food, so something may be implied. On the right side, you see exogenous molecules, and that really means uh, chemistry that is coming from the outside. So that might be pesticides, but it also might be things that are uh, natural products of fermentation that are often on the bloom or the skin of an apple or other things that are just not endogenously coming from inside the plant itself. So 
the, the PTFI can analyze all of those exogenous molecules, but also the molecules that are inside the plant. So in this tomato, we might see the micronutrients, which are the vitamins and minerals that you are often familiar with, that you see on most labels but also the macronutrients, so the things like the proteins, the fats, the carbohydrates, but in much greater detail so we can fully describe what's in our foods. And then perhaps the most interesting are these secondary or specialized metabolites, which include things that you often hear about the in the news like anthocyanins or flavonoids, terpenoids. These are the real special chemistry because all those other things that I mentioned are pretty much in every plant. It's often called the primary metabolism or the basal metabolism. And those are the things that, like the fats, lipids, and carbohydrates that are in all of our foods, pretty much in a, in a, in a way that cha the levels change, but they are the same types of molecules. The secondary metabolites are very unique. Every plant has the ability to make very special particular molecules. It's where we get our medicines from, uh, that come from plants in particular. Um, when a plant makes a specific compound, it's usually, it can be to deter a pest. So let's say that there's a caterpillar chewing on the leaf of a plant. The plant may respond in that environment by creating a particular compound that will det deter the feeding of that caterpillar. And those are the secondary metabolites. So we are then consuming those things. And often those things that are poisonous to the outside world of insects and other things can in small doses sometimes be medicine or support our own health. So it's actually a very complex world of understanding. With all these data, science has still lacked the tools to connect how the genes of the plant connect to this complex chemistry and to the environment. This is a huge gap. So you hear a lot about genetic studies and we are able to describe the specific genetics of a plant, but we have not been able to specifically describe how the genes of that plant translate into a specific chemistry based on the environment. And this is a really essential thing to describe because as scientists are developing uh, new crops that may uh, be better adapted for a changing world, we don't yet know exactly how the environment will interact with those uh, genes that are uh, in those plants, but this will help us understand that. And as I said, to do all that, we need standardization. Here's an example of why this is important. You can see on the left, we ran the same exact apple sample, the, in the same exact one, in three different labs. We detected 927 named compounds in that apple. And among those three labs, only 14 of them overlapped. So when you send an apple to a laboratory to know what is in it, what's the nutrition of it, what are all these complex metabolites or chemistry of, of the plant, we, it really has depended on what lab you send it to. So with these new standardized tools, that is eliminated and the same compounds will be can be detected in every lab. In that map of the global ecosystem, every one of those labs is able to detect the same complex thousands of molecules in those uh, plants and other foods. Now, I mentioned these specialized or secondary metabolites, which are so important to the survival of the plant and ultimately to our own survival as we consume them. Well, when we look at the chemistry of a plant, I often describe it as think about the night sky and you have a telescope and you might see one little piece of that night sky. Up until now, that's how we have looked at plant chemistry and our food chemistry. But the truth is that there's a wide swath of unknown night sky. And we often call that the dark matter of our food. So as we eat food, we're consuming things that we don't even know what's in there because they're kind of the unknown unknowns. We don't even know to look for them. So that is also what the Periodic Table of Food Initiative is seeking to solve. So those are addressing the tools. Now, if we look at the data themselves, in April, we launched after four and a half years of working on this to develop those standardized tools to build this global ecosystem and we launched with our first 500 foods from 250 species. So we already have more standardized chemistry data on foods than any other database that exists. It includes, very importantly, what we call the metadata. So when you think of a, composi of, of a database full of food composition, you would see the chemistry. So let's say you see um, how much fat is in that, uh, or a specific type of fat, or how much sugar, let's say glucose, is in an apple. The, 
th that's what you would typically see in a composition database is how much of that particular compound. But the metadata are very important because the metadata describe all the other things that might have happened to that apple to get to you and ultimately be analyzed. What that means is that how the apple is grown, where it's grown, how it's processed, is it apple sauce, is it apple pie, is it a, a raw apple, all those things change the chemistry. So in this database, you can capture all of that information. Was the apple grown regeneratively? What was the weather like when the apple was grown? And then we have the chemistry data on top of that. And you can start to match now that. And if you imagine a database with thousands of foods under thousands of compositions, you start to see that you could build a quite powerful scientific tool to predict how different uh, pieces of that metadata, let's say the weather or the type of agriculture, will ultimately impact the chemistry and can ultimately impact our health. Also, access and benefit sharing protocols, which may sound like a wonky set of words, but actually it's very important. If you, as you look at that map of the global ecosystem, you can see that there's communities all around the world that are using these tools and developing these data. Access and benefit sharing is a term of art that refers to how communities can have uh, the ability to access those data that are created, so making sure it's free and open to those communities that grew those plants for 10,000 years, cultivated them as their own species, to make sure that they can actually access it, and that any benefits that might come from the data or knowledge around those, uh, da uh, those specific data, um, the benefits flow back to those communities. There are international agreements that help us understand this, but in this we've been very proactive to make sure that any community, any indigenous community or frontline community has control over the access and benefit sharing of any knowledge or data that's generated from those communities. And this is really a new innovation. Um, this hasn't been the way things are done. Currently, especially in the global north, there sit vast amounts of digital data that come from plants and foods from all over the world and there is not access and benefit sharing for those data. So in many ways, we've become a pioneer in making sure that those data can, the, that the benefits can flow back to those communities. And we do it all in coordination with those communities. We can even build sequestered databases for indigenous communities so that they can see the, the data and knowledge around their foods and can decide when and if it's open to the rest of the world. So through all of this, we're really building the deepest and most comprehensive database of food composition in the world, not just composition, but food knowledge. As I mentioned, all these other metadata on top of what is actually in the foods. And we've developed this through democratizing those, these analytical platforms. So as I mentioned, your mouth and your body and your brain are a type of instrument that detects what's in foods but now we have these standardized instruments that can, can detect w everything that's in food as well and a database to secure those knowledge as a global commons, something that is open to the world to use. The third piece is training because there is the question of so what? So you've created all of these vast troves of data and we'll be looking at them to understand our food much better, or the plants, uh, the plant foods in particular. And two ways that we're doing this is through Food EDU and the Good Food Fellows. So Food EDU is um, an online educational platform that teaches, one, how to collect these data, how to use them responsibly, how to generate a question around food that might be answered by the periodic table of food. It's, an, it's a whole collection of hours of a wealth of information that anyone in the world can access and understand how to look at their food better and collect these comprehensive data. And then we have the Good Food Fellows, which are fellowships that are given to the Global South Centers of Excellence, the seven that were listed on the, that map that you saw. And they uh, are given uh, edu uh, training as well as funding to finish their education in a food-related a research project that uses food data. So right now we have 50 fellows all around the world that are finishing their master's or PhD or postdoc programs um, using this tool to answer questions that are locally important to them. Uh, that's part of the condition of receiving the fellowship is that the questions should be community relevant and should be developed with their local communities. So this all builds on a greater vision that enables data-driven solutions across food systems 
building from these essential pieces of how we, that are all connected to our food from production, processing, procurement, consumption of waste, and then how can food omics, which is the study of the full comprehensive chemistry of food, how can we apply those uh, tools to answer questions about those essential pieces of the food system? And th all of these represent uh, questions and projects that those Good Food Fellows are addressing right now. The key research questions that we start to see coming out, I mean, one that you might all be thinking as you look at your food label and wonder, well, what is in the dark matter of this thing that I'm eating, is what is in the food that we eat? It seems like such a silly, simple question that we might all assume that we already know this. But the truth is, we have not been able to do good science on our food because we haven't had the basic, essential, uh, empirical data that is standardized across platforms in our foods. What are the implications for people and planet? So by collecting all of these metadata, we might be able to clearly say, and we have many projects on this, whether regenerative agriculture or agroecology or organic agriculture produces foods that are truly better for people and planet than the conventional ways of doing agriculture. And you might say, well, of course they would be better for the planet. But what about the chemical differences between those things? There are very limited studies that look at regeneratively produced crops versus uh, conventional, but they haven't been done under standardized means, and they haven't collected the type of comprehensive metadata that I d I've described. We have a metadata module around regenerative agriculture right now that we're running that has 50 different parameters that allow us to look at all the different regenerative practices, as I said, the weather, and many other things that are happening on a farm, and correlate them to the chemistry of the foods themselves. And how so and that goes, how does this composition vary based on how food is grown? That's one of the core questions that we're seeking to answer. So as we move forward, I really have been talking a lot about the research, and that's the first phase. We need to collect, as, as you saw, there's 500 foods that we have done, but we have a list of thousands of the world's foods that we intend, we're in the process of processing all of them as we speak, just to know what is in the food. Let's have a database that is full of what is in the food. What in, the, in that food is most important? You know, if you have 10,000 compounds of the food, how do we know what it, which of those is actually going to be important for human health? And that's going to take additional research. We translate to, to practitioners. So not everyone needs to be an analytical chemist in order to use this tool, right? There's nutritionists, there's doctors, there's farmers. All of those are practitioners that can use the data from the periodic table of food to answer, to at both ask and answer questions that are relevant to them. And ultimately, we want that to translate to policies. And we feel that by providing these standardized empirical data, it is one clear driving force for ultimately changing policy and making sure that we have a better world for both people and planet. Thank you so much. <laughs>